Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, Recovery or Relapse, Tools to Help Local Governments Navigate the Financial Realities of COVID. I'm Melissa Keene. I'm a Senior Program Manager with the Institute for Local Government and will be your host and moderator this afternoon. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged many local governments, revenues, and budgets. As California begins to reopen, local agencies are assessing their options to continue to provide essential services and programming. This webinar will share an update of the state of local government finances um, and share creative options available to you all to bolster revenues. Uh, we will also discuss tax me measures, EIFDs, and other available tools to help you all continue to navigate into the future. Here's a high-level overview of today's agenda. Um, so we're just gonna be doing a quick welcome and um, share some logistical information. We're gonna hear presentations from each of our panelists Bobby Young with HDL, uh, Tim Stufert with NBS, and Pat West, a former city manager with the city of Long Beach. Um, after those short presentations, we're gonna go into a panel discussion. Um, so you'll hear a little bit more from each of our panelists um, at that point. And then we have some time held at the end for a Q&A from you all. And then we will share some information about upcoming webinars. You've probably noticed that your line has been muted um, and your line will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't ask us questions. So you should see a questions box in your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, you can type questions at any point during this presentation in there, and we will be monitoring those on the back end and responding as needed or getting them into the queue for our Q&A at the end of the webinar. Just a little bit of information about ILG in case you aren't super familiar with us. Uh, we are a nonprofit affiliate of the League of California Cities the California State Association of Counties, and the California Special Districts Association. And we provide practical and easy to use resources so that local governments can effectively implement policies on the ground. We do this in a number of ways. Um, so we provide a lot of education and training, uh, similar to this webinar that you're on today, as well as conference sessions um, and other uh, in-depth trainings um, throughout the state. We provide technical assistance and capacity building services for local governments. We have a whole host of resources on our website for people to access, and then we also provide convening uh, for local governments as well. We focus in four main areas. We have programs on leadership and governance, which covers a lot of the local government basics, um, as well as some of the state mandated trainings that you all are required to take around ethics and um, other issues there. Um, we have a program focused on civics education and workforce, so helping create that pipeline to public service and facilitate municipal school partnerships really get young folks interested in local government as a career path. There are a program focused on public engagement, which covers a whole host of things, um, but really helps um, to embed public engagement into local government operations um, and address things from even getting started to where you start with public engagement processes, dealing with difficult meeting participants, um, how do you have those challenging conversations with your community around um, some highly controversial topics that um, you all are navigating your way through right now. And lastly, we have a program focused on sustainable communities. Uh, so right now, this program is focused a lot on housing, um, as well as uh, climate um, capacity building, so connecting folks to cap and trade funding, um, helping them with energy savings, greenhouse gas reductions, things of that nature. So if you're not super familiar with us, definitely encourage you to check out our website. We have a lot of free resources um, and other uh, webinars and training opportunities um, available to you all. So as I mentioned just a bit ago, um, we've got three great presenters with us this afternoon. Uh, Bobby Young is a principal with HDL Companies. Tim Sufert is a managing director with NBS. And Pat West uh, is a former city manager with the city of Long Beach and has a, an illustrious career in local government um, and now uh, works on the other side of the consulting um, bench and helps local governments, uh, continues to help local governments. So first up, we're going to hear from Bobby. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Bobby? Great. Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate that. Um, Bobby Young, HDL Services, uh, HDL Sales Tax. Um, with HDL, I'm a principal, but also the client services director, leading the team that comes out to meet with all of our clients on a quarterly basis. Um, actually, if you go to the next slide, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about the company. Um, you guys can see my experience is needed, but uh, with HDL, many of you uh, may already know of us. Those who don't, uh, our clients include cities, counties, and special districts. We maintain uh, very proudly about a 99% client retention rate overall and different services that, uh, that we get into and, and help our clients with sales tax and transactions tax analysis, auditing services, 
uh, focused around those property tax, uh, economic development, cannabis, and then tax and fee administration of different revenue streams. And this has been a, a pretty strong growth area for us as we help um, especially cities with business license, TOT and short-term rental uh, payments and compliance efforts. And then also utility users tax and franchise uh, fee uh, tax payments. So it's kind of everything that uh, we're into trying to help local agencies with a lot of different revenue streams and really uh, take care of at least that side of the ledger, help take, uh, help manage that side. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, as uh, as many of us know, the initial uh, the initial economic impacts that the uh, the pandemic brought on had many uh, a lot of us fearing that we would be setting ourselves up for a pretty deep recession. Um, you know, large impacts to uh, to local agencies. And so it's pretty important to come back and remind ourselves the steps that the federal government has taken. I've, I've listed a few here, just the, the most notable ones over this last year that have really um, helped maintain and sustain the economy. And this is, um, as we go through and, and you'll hear me talk, it's, it's almost a complete 180 compared to what we were thinking a year ago this time as we were preparing forecasts and, and what the impacts would be. And so by way of these four, what you'll see, the bottom one there is the ARPA uh, Act that uh, most recently got approved in March. And uh, we'll have a couple of slides and, and more conversations specifically around that uh, later in the presentation. But how this has all trickled down there on the next slide is again, maybe the most tangible way for us to to think about um, how our economy has uh, has benefited. First, most notably, right out the blocks was an increase in unemployment benefits that helped uh, with the uh, folks that were you know, taken off their jobs or, or fired uh, because of the shelter in place directives. Next up, uh, initial cash payments out to individuals, especially those with children of $1,200 and $500 uh, per child and uh, what that meant for their bank accounts. And then homeowners were given a bit of a reprieve with mortgage forbearance uh, for six plus months to, uh, to help out and keep some of their money, which, uh, which again, no doubt we're seeing, we're gonna end up seeing a lot of that uh, trickle through the data. Additional $600 payment, and then most notably, uh, as of late with the ARPA funding, up to $1,400 per person with, uh, with different income limits. But again, thinking of our blue collar uh, workforce and, and those especially here within different California communities, uh, this is a large amount of money that's been able to, uh, to trickle down uh, back into uh, to help sustain us. So then as we look the next slide, um, we did just recently, we uh, HDL did just recently get the first quarter sales uh, data. So that'd be the January, February, March sales period that we're analyzing and getting ready to, to talk about with our clients. You'll see that here on this slide. As we break apart the sales tax data, the 1% Bradley Burns statewide, you can see some of the larger industry groups and the depths that the, uh, especially the shelter in place directive had impacted them like general consumer goods, restaurants, uh, most notably. And then the growth that we've seen, uh, especially out of that top line, the solid green, uh, the county and the state and county use tax pools really think online shopping here and, uh, and what that's meant. The other fascinating result uh, that, uh, that we've seen is kind of that orangish line, orange-ish line that goes through the middle there on autos and transportation, just phenomenal mind-blowing for us to uh, to see the last three quarters growth that exceeds the pre-pandemic periods there you'll see comparing to 2018 and 2019. Uh, just kind of uh, again mind-blowing for us to think that's uh, as much spending and revenue generation as uh, that's been happening as of late. Um, so uh, so that's kind of you know what we're seeing with regards to uh, specific industry groups there on the right side, you can see overall for the state, the depths that cut in in 2Q, but then really is these last three quarters and that strong rebound. Again, most we can't uh, lose sight the fact of how much federal money uh, has benefited us. On a, on a more national level, if we hear 
uh, economists and others say that we experienced a V-shaped, a strong V-shaped recovery while going through the pandemic and post-pandemic, it, uh, it probably should not come as a bit of a surprise. And, and I think the graph there on the right or the line, the line chart there really helps uh, you know, show that, especially when you compare to pre-pandemic periods, what, uh, what it's all meant. And it's, uh, uh, again, pretty, been pretty fascinating to, to watch and, and think about how we're gonna need to change our, our thinking uh, or our expectations on the, on the future. Next slide here just shows a comparison that we've been uh, keeping track of, and we've got data going back to 2000 uh, there on the left, but the traditional brick and mortar stores is the top green line there with online shopping activity, both from fulfillment centers and by way of uh, county use tax pool allocations, you can see is the blue. And obviously the more dramatic increases these last two years of note, the jump into 2019 had a lot to do with AB 147. You can see my notes there on the right side and the, uh, the regulations on out-of-state online retailers. Then you roll in the effects of the pandemic with that and how uh, dramatic online shopping uh, sales tax revenue generation has increased. And the demise of brick and mortar, <laughs> um, probably not completely unexpected. This will be an, a very interesting graph for us to continue to watch over these next few years as brick and mortar will expect to rebound and come back up. What, uh, what's gonna be the offset or, or what is the online portion gonna look like? Is it going to flatten out completely or decrease a little bit as shoppers go back in stores? Very interesting dynamic, but uh, you can see how quickly with uh, the state of the infrastructure of online businesses and, and merchants, how quickly consumers were able to, uh, to toggle and, and switch from brick and mortar stores. So next slide I think is just the uh, sales tax considerations. And when we were talking with clients and we, we put together forecasts last quarter and have been through the pandemic, some of these trends that we're, um, we're looking at for this next fiscal year, obviously the pandemic has in hand incre enhanced the growth of online sales activity uh, versus traditional brick and mortar. But restaurants and gas stations, if you go back to, if you look back at that line graph, you can see haven't really rebounded. We're expecting that to be the next thing to rebound and probably this summer as we uh, start the fiscal year 20, uh, 2021. It uh, probably will expect to see that growth continue, you know, really, really jump up where building and business to business activity will, uh, should remain fairly steady and maybe increase a little bit. You'll hear me talk about housing when we talk about uh, property tax, but uh, there's no uh, no continued let, let down that we're expecting on that front. It's autos and sales that, uh, including RVs and toys, boats and motorcycles, which people have been spending a lot of with that extra cash. Uh, this could be the only industry where we uh, will expect or may anticipate a bit of a bubble. And uh, the sum, this summer, summer of 2020, 21 will uh, will really tell us that story if uh, if the pandemic period was a bit more isolated. So very quickly, those are what we're looking at uh, in a general sense for uh, for this next fiscal year on sales tax. Thinking about property tax and what uh, what's happened there, you can see that the fiscal year 2021, the period that we're just wrapping up right now for most agencies, those were uh, those assessed values were already in place pre-pandemic. And so uh, not much expected to fall off. And then as we really look through these next few bullet points of what's happened during the pandemic, median home values uh, have increased and are still selling. Homes are selling very quickly in me major metropolitan areas. Even as folks look to get out of big cities, being able to work remotely or anticipating working remotely going forward, um, moving into more of the rural and mountain areas, those prices and those there, uh, thereby future assessed values are still continuing to increase as that sales activity happens. Um, residential building permits continue to rise and that really speaks to the lack of overall housing that, uh, that we seem to maintain here in California. It's always a need for more. Um, so 
that bottom point there, even more dramatic growth uh, expected in those rural or less developed regions by way of exodus out of metropolitan areas, but then development of new housing. So a lot of positive fronts uh, to come, we think, on, uh, on property taxes. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the considerations that we have. <clears throat> the, uh, the assessed values that were enrolled here back on January 1st, 2021, that'll That'll be effective for the fiscal year 21-22. Those were based on the calendar 2020 activity, which just doesn't seem to be as impacted by the overall pandemic. Uh, and, and in many cases, and in many communities, we're expecting to see, uh, you know, assessed values increase. Now, the uh, the second bullet point there is really probably the most notable to watch is the annual inflationary factor did fall below or you know is lower than the normal two percent increase that uh, uh, the cap under prop 13 uh, so we're only going to see a uh, about a one percent increase 1.01 percent overall um, so really kind of watch your property tax revenue streams if uh, if you have more of a um, uh, you know kind of a long-term community that uh, hasn't you haven't seen as many transactions haven't seen a lot of movement your annual inflationary factor isn't probably going to be what it was in the past couple of years. Commercial properties are also uh, going to be, could be a little bit more impacted, and that'll be largely dependent on the, uh, the future remote work environment that businesses consider as we reopen the economy. A couple more here just to uh, set the tone for, uh, again, the overall uh, economic conditions and what we've seen. Um, for TOT and short-term rentals, obviously, hugely impacted by the lack of travel, foreign travel, business travelers, the shelter in place, uh, kind of all of that initially impacting the uh, the TOT revenues. And some hotels were even taken over for home to house homeless during the pandemic, and the, uh, especially through the winter months, trying to get them additional housing and, and out of the cold. Um, so this has been one industry, as you go to the next slide there, You'll see our considerations for next year. It does have seem to have the ability to possibly rebound uh, stronger than what we otherwise, and many industry experts were otherwise forecasting. So greater distribution of the vaccine could mean more summer travel. We've already seen Memorial Day travel, heard all about it through the news of how much people were getting back out and, uh, and um, thereby likely increasing their overnight stays. The per night hotel rates are on the rise, especially in highly desirable areas, trying to take advantage of folks coming back in. Short term rentals have been more popular than ever, both for travelers and for homeowners that uh, maybe it's their second home, maybe it's a vacation home. Now go ahead and take advantage of those higher hotel nights uh, to generate some income for them for themselves and hopefully then remitting that uh, their portion of the uh, the TOT rate. We are anticipating amusement parks and convention centers to uh, to fully reopen later in the fall of 21, uh, thereby getting ourselves back and those of us on the business side back into um, in-person conventions and uh, and conferences. So uh, likely to see this, this definitely, like I said, has the potential of rebounding. I think the initial thoughts were um, overall, the tourism industry probably wouldn't rebound for about three to three to four years. And um, what we're seeing right now in this bent up demand, it could uh, could rebound stronger in the beginning than what we thought, and then gradually continue with a uh, with a steady increase. So um, more to come for certain on uh, on uh, TOT and short term rentals. The uh, the next stereo. Uh, so that was uh, more on the economics. So as your agency. If you're, um, you know, thinking about how to balance your budget and the potential for new sales tax revenue um, by way of a ballot measure, you can see here that uh, we have seen the total number of districts continue to increase. It um, has historically, at least these last few election cycles, there's been a greater capacity to uh, to adopt a local tax measure to increase um, uh, revenues. And about 95% of the state's population overall lives within some sort of transactions and use tax district. So they're not as uncommon as they had been previously and the stigmatism around them seems to decrease, has been decreasing. Uh, I'll leave it up to Pat to talk a little bit about the, uh, the voters desire for, uh, to vote new taxes uh, here post pandemic. But um, 
if uh, again, if you are thinking about a new sales tax measure, a couple of things to consider. Next slide, please. Next one. There. Oh, almost. One more. There you go. So, uh, a general versus specific tax. If uh, uh, to you know, some will consider a, a specific or a special tax because it might be more. Um, amenable to the voters, but just something to consider with a general tax, and you'll see that here, revenue and taxation code, um, it does require just a simple majority, 50 plus one vote of the qualified voters. So it's sometimes a little easier to pass by way of numbers, whereas a specific tax, which is the next slide, you'll see requires a two thirds uh, vote of the qualified voters. So you're really looking at uh, you know 66, uh, in excess of 66% to get a specific tax. So just a, something to consider, a uh, little bit easier passage rate uh, when it comes to a general tax versus specific. Next slide, please. Okay, and so the other thing, really working backwards, if you're thinking about that sales tax measure, when do you want to put it on the ballot and then all of the communication and the timeline necessary to, uh, to obtain a, success, a successful ballot measure really looking uh, we will inevitably have a general election come november 22 and if you're thinking or if your council starts thinking about that time frame you're really ramping up the communications and starting in january 2022 which is uh, six months away uh, no doubt the uh, framework for that conversation comes as a part of the the budget that you're looking to adopt right now, but uh, that communication really does need to uh, to start fairly soon for a ballot measure. Then the uh, the next slide is um, inevitably the uh, if your agency does have success is really reminding uh, the expectations on when to see that cash flow. So a November 22 approval by the voters won't go into effect until April 1, 2023. So it's quite a ways down the road. And then your first full year, fiscal year of revenues, really won't hit until fiscal year 22, or I'm sorry, 23, 24. So it, uh, it definitely needs to, when you're thinking about that ballot measure, you're having a kind of more of a longer range outlook uh, for it to be able to uh, uh, see that money come hit your coffers. A couple of slides here to talk about the ARPA. Um, American Rescue Plan Act that was approved, $1.9 trillion uh, by the federal government, it includes $350 billion state and local funding, uh, with $8 billion coming to, to California cities. What can this be spent on? And I know that there was a, a webinar today by the League uh, earlier this morning. There's uh, another one in a couple of weeks, uh, I think, through CSMFO. So there's a lot of information coming out on ARPA, but it, uh, it can cover a broad range of pandemic related spending possibilities and a lot of flexibility on how best to, uh, to allocate within your own community. A couple of distinctions between entitlement cities, populations greater than 500,000, your money's gonna come from the federal government. On non-entitled cities, populations less than 50,000, your, uh, your allocations will come by way of the state. And just a few bullet points on considerations for uh, for your local agency when thinking about your ARPA funding. Again, just an additional source to balance out your budget. Um, really think about both your short-term and your long-term priorities here. Um, you can recover lost revenue, but uh, also you can maintain or create a targeted assistance to uh, to business sectors such as food service or tourism that may have been hit the hardest by the pandemic. Um, your agency can establish grant and, lo uh, and loan programs uh, to help small business owners. And any uh, spending or uh, expenditures related to affordable housing, homelessness, infrastructure investments, and technology enhancements, um, just kind of keep your mind open to different things that uh, the ARPA funding can be spent on. And I think that's it for my side. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bobby. I um, really appreciate you sharing some of the, the trends and forecasting that you all are seeing um, and looking forward to hearing more from you in a little bit when we get to the panel discussion. Just a quick reminder for the attendees on the line, if you have any questions that come up during these presentations, please drop them into the questions box 
um, on the right hand side of your screen and we will get to those um, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but next up we have Tim Stuvert with um, NBS. Tim? Great. Good afternoon, everybody. I understand we have a couple hundred folks out there listening, so I uh, want to uh, give you some value, um, shift gears a little bit about uh, from some of the information that Bobby shared with us and go into some uh, ideas for you to uh, generate revenues as we come out of this pandemic. So go to the next slide, please. So I know there are a few communities who have actually fared uh, well during this pandemic, but I'm guessing that most of the folks that are here are looking for revenue ideas and looking to, uh, to rebound or spring out of the, the pandemic here as we go forward. So please, the uh, next slide. Um, as we've talked about, Bobby shared some details here, a lot of different taxes uh, have really uh, gone down some have imploded in certain regions and that's been exacerbated also by just sort of changes in in infrastructure um where everything from you know opening or reopening of, of certain facilities or closing of facilities um, permanently in some cases um, there's also this uh the chula vista versus sandoval rda decision which hit a lot of cities quite hard in the pocketbook and just many other changes that are going on. So what can we do given that backdrop? Next slide. I like to sort of uh, synthesize all this information into what I'm calling a five-step plan. But before I go into that, I just wanted to, to, to have everybody think about three things. One, when you're coming out of this pandemic, first thing is don't assume don't assume anything is is going to be the same as before right the second thing is to just step back look at the situation from a real holistic um, viewpoint and then bring think strategically as you go forward and and that's where we want to uh, be strategic in this five-step plan so the first thing which is very not sexy but is very important is understand your 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 costs and what those costs are going to look like going forward so update that cost allocation plan that maybe has been sitting and getting dusty over the last who knows how many years the second one is update your fees uh, many fees were not adjusted and i understand during the pandemic uh you know nobody wanted to necessarily adopt fees or or uh, increase fees but you need to think about your fee structure, look at it and figure out what makes most sense. There's also a lot of you know, new fees, um, you know, parklets or outdoor restaurants and all the different things that have morphed over time that we didn't have to think about two years ago. The third one here is to consider, Bobby alluded to some of this, but general and special taxes, right? Um, is it time for those uh, sales taxes or is it time for you know, maybe a parcel tax or what have you? The fourth part of this plan is to research what what I like to call special financing districts. So that is your, you know, community facilities districts, CFDs, assessment districts, property related fees, all of those we're going to talk about here briefly. And then lastly is really understand, do the homework um, on your what are the fiscal impacts and development impacts of things that are going to change as we come out of this 15 month hibernation really is what it's been. So next slide, please. This is a bit of a long list and these are not in any priority, but wanted to just briefly hit these and we could spend uh, hours and hours on a lot of these. There is the new, relatively new in enhanced infrastructure financing district. Those can be valuable um, in certain places. Um, but they are very specific to communities that have a high share of the property taxes. So uh, they can be good. They're not a panacea. They're not an answer to redevelopment as they currently stand, but can really work for, for uh, projects in certain areas, and especially if you have, you have the cooperation of a couple of different agencies like a county and a city. The second, and I'll, I'll have an example here, is looking at the fiscal impact analysis of changes of new development, that kind of thing, looking at what your revenues are versus the expense, right? And we'll talk about that. CFDs, uh, sometimes known as Melarus districts, 
Um, parcel taxes are kind of their cousin there. And then assessment districts been around for well over 100 years. They still have their place in many communities uh, for certain things. Property related fees are really, um, you know, there's the sort of water sewer trash that we're familiar with, but then there's also storm drain and other types of fees that a county service area, for example, might be able to um, implement. And then you have your development impact and capacity fees for utilities. So these are one-time capital fees that again, like, your, like all your fees should be tuned up, especially as, as development seems to, uh, in, in many communities right now is really roaring back. And then review in particular, reason I put this on this list is that, you know, community development and public works, uh, what do we call user fees. So, you know, permits to build new buildings or add on or, or do different things that are on a voluntary nature. So that's our laundry list. I'm gonna shift gears with the next slide and go into really many case studies here. And hopefully these will resonate with, uh, with many of you. And again, my, our goal or my goal is that you come away with at least one or two ideas that you can go back and start kicking the tires on. So if we have a city that's, uh, and this example is actually one here in the San Francisco Bay Area in the East Bay that has, still has a lot of raw land development and really coming uh, online now with folks um, buying homes and what have you. So those raw land developments really lend themselves to a CFD Right, community facilities districts or uh, an assessment district. In a lot of communities, there are these islands that need infrastructure. Maybe they were part of the county and they're annexing to the city and they may need water and sewer. They've been on septic or something like that. So an assessment district is a great choice for, for those. And in this city, there is also a lot going on in a, in a redevelopment mode where the downtown is, uh, has a lot of opportunity for um, hotel, convention center, new uses, new housing, um, new infrastructure, that first we need to understand the fiscal impact, that's the FIA, and then look at these tools that can help us fund and finance the desired improvements. Next one, please. This is a good to sort of uh, to get your head around in a very quick uh, moment here about the fiscal impact analysis that I'm talking about. And so in this example that I gave about a downtown that's seeing a lot of development pressure is your expenses on the right or sorry on the left will uh, exceed the, the revenues that are on the right. So how do you make up that difference? Is it something that the general fund can absorb or do you need one of those list of tools that we were just uh, discussing in the previous slides to, to take up you know, and fill that gap? Let's go to the next vignette here. So this may not be a developing area, but a, a city that has become a, a, what I'm calling a revenue challenge city, they were somewhat almost fat and happy if you could say that uh, a year or two ago. And then the pandemic has really hit them hard with their hotel and sales taxes just way down. They're not the community where people are traveling to at the moment. They also were hit hard by the redevelopment uh, decision that I mentioned earlier. So what are they doing? They are actively and strategically looking at um, a CFD community wide for public safety. They're tuning up their general fee schedule and they're also looking at their um, old uh, existing property related fee for stormwater and looking at um, possibly increasing that so that they can get back into better fiscal sustainability. Next slide. This is out in the Central Valley, uh, a city that has uh, a lot of development pressure going on and uh, annexations from the county. And interestingly enough, is that the way this, the, this tax structure is there really needed to do a fiscal impact analysis. And what that told us is that the city was gonna take on these certain areas and actually we're going to get less property tax um, with the way the county was structured and the way the special districts and who is doing what. So they really needed to understand that for two reasons. One, 
to be able to discuss with the county how the actual agreement should work with the annexations and the, and the, the base 1% property tax, as well as how does this affect the landowner and what the expectations were of, of services and what have you, so that maybe there needs to be some kind of tool used in that list of what we talked about, you know, whether it's impact fees or ongoing uh, assessments and parcel taxes and that kind of thing. One more example is another city is having significant changes in their um, in their structure with uh, permanent closure of a, a prison and that kind of thing, and looking at the economics of of how the pandemic is going to. Uh, treat the, the next you know year or two and looking at the fees there as well so again it's that tuning up of these tools that maybe got a little dusty and uh, not not viewed actively over the last few years next slide please my last little vignette here as my time is coming to close um, Bobby had mentioned a lot of development that's going on in the foothills and a lot of folks at least, uh, well, temporarily maybe fleeing uh, the larger cities and metropolitan areas and going out to areas. This might resonate with some of you. So a community services district, CSD, has um, a lot of growth going on and they're also having a lot of revenue challenges because they're um, they have a, a quilt, if you will, of different service providers and, and county and that kind of thing, and who does what and how these services can be provided with the demands that uh, the new residents are, are having on the system. So this particular CSD um, is, is implementing some development impact fees, and obviously uh, being a CSD, they have to cooperate with the, with the county and the other agencies in the area. And then also looking at a uh, an ongoing CFD to to fund ongoing park and fire services as uh, that committed that community really grows and grows rapidly. So with that, I believe that is my my last slide. I know we're going to de delve into some of these topics a little more in our uh, panel discussion and Q and A. So I will pass the baton. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, and yeah, looking forward to hearing more from you in the discussion in a little bit. I'm um, going to turn it over to Pat West now to provide a little bit uh, more from the local government side of things with his time um, in Long Beach and some other um, cities um, down in the LA area, um, sharing some of that perspective. So Pat? Thanks, Melissa. Next slide. So let's go down memory lane for just a little bit. It's only been 15 months and look what we've experienced. A worldwide pandemic, a medical crisis, stay at home orders, closing businesses, civil unrest, social justice, environmental justice, defund police, conspiracy theories, homeless population explosion, hate crimes, Karen videos, national election drama, and to mask or not to mask. So with apologies to Joe Pesci in the movie, My Cousin Vinny, is there any more stuff we can pile on top of this year? I think it's fair to say that it's been a year of Sophie's choices for the elected officials in throughout the United States. For those of us in local government, nothing can rival this period in our lives, except for those of you who lived through the Second World War. But at the end of the day, Ours is truly one of the most rewarding professions anyone could have. And after 39 years, I continue to believe that in my heart of hearts. Next. So recovery or relapse. As we're looking for things to get back to normal, think about this quote from the author, Anne Lamott. Almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. When you reopen your city halls, you have to reboot and somehow deal with all of your employees, given what they've been through and all their different experiences. Look at the elected officials. As I just mentioned, you've been making Sophie's choices for 15 months. This is a lot, this is very stressful. You've had super hard decisions to make for your community and also deal with your constituents that support those decisions or don't support those decisions, but you still have to make them. 
and most of this has been done virtually. The managers of your communities, they've been implementing these hard decisions and they've been managing the daily crisis this pandemic has brought. The employees, communication, budget, who can work from home, who can't work from home. And trust me, that's been a lot of drama in every city hall that I know of. And also too, as I go around and talk to my colleagues in other cities, small cities or large cities, everyone agrees that it's probably the busiest time they've ever been in their entire lives. It's just been crazy um, during this pandemic. And so you've got um, the frontline staff as well. You've got public safety, public works, park maintenance, outreach work workers. Nobody in these fields have worked from home. They've had a totally different experience during COVID. There probably are a lot of lingering issues about those who couldn't work from home versus those who could work from home. So those are things that you're gonna have to deal with um, as everybody comes back together. And then once you are back together, your staff has to understand what the public and the private sector have been through as well. The public, of course, stay at home orders, no school, kids at home all day, work from home, right down to no toilet paper. The private sector, each industry has been hit differently. They'll need lots of TLC and communication. So also one of the key, key, key things is please pay attention to your permit and plan check processes in your development services departments or building departments. The private sector is going to flow to those cities that have the quickest permits or that can process stuff in a reasonable fashion. And, and you're gonna lose a lot of development or a lot of businesses or a lot of opportunity for sales tax or for employment for your residents if you don't get these permits flowing quickly and that, that's really a crisis. Next. So I wanna focus a little bit on some of the crazy, crazy innovative things that many of you have been doing during COVID. Next. So many of you have heard the movie, We Bought a Zoo. Well, Santa Clarita bought an ice station. They have a 93,000 square foot ice station. Um, it's an ice rink, several ice rinks on four acres of property. That went bankrupt. They paid $14 million and bought it. They said that they could use it for conferences, for workshops, for graduations, for special events, for recreation. If you can imagine, that was a little controversial in the middle of a pandemic. Well, months later, who knocks on their door? It's the LA Kings and ASEC. It's the American Sports and Entertainment Company. They joined Santa Clarita as partners in this facility, and it's been a marriage made in heaven ever since. So what a great idea. Next. Bellflower. Bellflower has implemented a crazy idea. It's called a self-certification and building permit process. I know Long Beach is looking at trying to emulate that. This is something that occurs in some of the larger cities on the East Coast. This allows qualified developers can certify their own construction certifications and inspections. Um, it's huge. It goes so fast, it's so much easier for the developers. There are a lot of teeth in there too, so that if there is an issue, there could be deconstructive tests and things like that. But it's a process that's been used heavily in Bellflower and it works. They've developed a homeless shelter with this um, process, this program, a parking garage. They've done residential projects. They've done a steel craft um, facility. And the owners of steel craft, um, Howard CDM, were so pleased with what they did there. They ended up buying a three-story JCPenney building in downtown Bellflower that was threatened with a wrecking ball and they turned it into their corporate headquarters for a three-story corporate headquarters and a maker space on the first floor and it's just added so much um, value and critical mass to their downtown all because of that process. Next. Paramount. Paramount requires a lot of conditional use permits um, for industrial properties in the region um, and they've been seen pre-COVID and during COVID that they've been seeing a lot of leakage of businesses that don't want to go through a conditional use permit process. As you know, anybody that's processed them or gone through them, they're tedious, they're time consuming, and there's a lot of uncertainty. It's not the cost, but the uncertainty at, that, at the end of that time that it could be denied is a huge thing. So many of these businesses have been going to cities that don't require conditional use permits for their uses, and Paramount's seen a lot of leakage. So to combat that, They've been busy working on something called a covenant um, agreement, overlying covenant agreements that will package industrial parks with one master conditional use permit. So businesses can just come in and get 24 hour over the over the counter approval for their businesses. So they're stopping this leakage 
And again, in order to do this, they go through the public hearing process, planning commission, city council to have these agreements put in place. And um, it's it's gonna be spark wonders for Paramount and hopefully they can attract a lot more businesses um, by bypassing that conditional use permit process. Next. So we're all familiar with Watts. Watts is doing some um, crazy stuff here. This is funded by the city of Los Angeles. This is a project called Watts Works. Um, in fact, today there was a, they, they had a huge event there today. This is a very, very low income modular um, residential complex. It's put together with cargo containers. It's a housing development, obviously. And today they put their fourth story on. This is four stories or 26 units, studio units on 6,000 square feet of property. That's pretty crazy, 6,000 square feet of property with a four story, 26 units on it. Now, the developers, Daylight Construction and Howard CDM will be the first to tell you that that's not the best ideal situation, 6,000 square feet with that kind of density, but they would prefer at least 15,000, but this was necessary. This was wanted by the community um, with all their homeless issues and things there, and it's gonna be fantastic when it opens up. Um, and Watts Works, um, these companies are doing three other projects throughout the county with a modular house. Next. So San Pedro, if anybody's um, gone to take a look at the US, Iowa, um, just down the block is the old Ports of Call. Well, Ports of Call during COVID has not been on hiatus. Um, they're redeveloping that property right now. And during the, the past 15 months, I can't tell you the construction that's been happening there. If you go drive by, parking lots, roads, bike lanes, pedestrian areas. Um, and again, it's all right next door to the um, US Iowa. So they have not skipped a beat in trying to redevelop the Ports of Call facility there in, Port, in um, San Pedro. So we're all excited to see what that's gonna turn out like. Next. City of Downey's also been crazy on infrastructure during COVID. They've remodeled a city library. They've remodeled their um, performing arts center. They've created a brand new fire station headquarters, um, several acres. Um, it's just huge. And they're doing a lot of other street work and a lot of stuff that's happening in Downey. If you drive through there, it's a, a lot of construction that's been going on the past 15 months and they haven't skipped a beat. Next. Long Beach has done some pretty crazy things too. Um, prior to COVID, Long Beach was very friendly to parklets. We did a lot of parklets in Long Beach. I think we had like, when I left there, were probably 25. And then it jumped during COVID, they went straight to 100, and now they have 250 parklets in the city of Long Beach. Um, I don't know what they'll be doing as they exit COVID, but they have 250 today. In addition to that, you probably all read about the, um, the bankruptcy of Urban Commons, who had the 66 year lease for the Queen Mary and the 40 adjacent acres. Well, the city, rather than rebidding that, they took it, they took the entire operation of the Queen Mary under their wing. And this is the first time they've done that in over 42 years. So that's a very, very bold move by the city of Long Beach in the middle of COVID to take over that ship and also control the destiny of the 40 acres that are in the port of um, Long Beach area adjacent to the Queen Mary. In addition to that, everybody's read that Long Beach willingly and, and graciously um, accepted 1,000 immigrant children uh, from the border area um, to be in their, to house inside their convention center, um, which is in the heart of the downtown. A lot of crazy stuff going on. Next. We talked about the ARPA dollars. I just want to point out that you should have a plan. There's going to be a lot of money flowing through and you got to have a plan. I know in Long Beach, I think they were looking at getting over $100 million. So they actually assigned a deputy city manager, created a brand new position to supervise that money. When you have that, those kinds of dollars going through, you got to make sure that you spend it wisely, how you want to get it spent, and that somebody's paying a lot of attention to that. So they did that. But you, every city should have a short-term plan and a long-term plan. Your short-term plan should hit the, um, the hard-hit industries and households the most vaccine incentives, the things you're already doing, increase local procurement, buy and dine, dine with campaigns, focus on the leisure, hospitality, and retail and restaurant businesses that have been um, hit hardest. And as I mentioned earlier, plan, on, you've got to take care of your process process for your plan check and your permits, and you've got to process that quickly. Um, you, and when you come out of this COVID, out of COVID, you've got to be able to do that as fast as you can. Next, for the long-term long -term strategy, 
just the, the same meat and potatoes that you're probably already doing, but things that are endemic for cities, economic development, workforce development, infrastructure investment, digital inclusion, and then business retention and expansion. Next. So let's talk a little about your financial tools as you're going forward. Um, it doesn't appear that everybody's been hit as hard as we thought we would 15 months ago, given all the money coming from the federal government. But here are the, um, the knobs that you can potentially twist uh, where most of your money comes from. It's sales tax, transit occupancy tax for hotels, TOT, utility users taxes, parcel taxes, pension bonds. They're becoming popular right now with, uh, to, to take care of your PERS pensions payoffs because of the low interest rates. I know Carson and Montebello have just done that. You're seeing some enhanced infrastructure financing districts happening. Um, these are back in the, this is kind of like the old redevelopment agency things, but it includes school districts and others. Um, so right now I know Laverne, uh, West Sacramento and Placentia have already developed um, EIFDs. And from what I understand, there's about 30 that are um, in the process of being developed throughout the state. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about that in my last slide is you should really pay a lot of attention to a business improvement district, and that's really important. In um, addition to um, what Tim had said, don't forget as we exit COVID to update your fees and fines and assessments as necessary. We've all been not collecting parking fees, and not issuing parking tickets and street sweeping, and there's so many things that's been waived, but it's about time to take a look and update those fees as necessary. And also remember, not surprisingly, the state and the county make lots of mistakes when they're managing your money. These are all of these taxes get to you through the state or the county. That's why companies like um, HDL, like Bobby, they, they exist. So they guarantee that the cities get exactly what they're what what they they're due and that there's not a mistake. And I'm sure um, most of your cities are working with companies like HDL to make that happen, but that's um, super important. Next. To implement these um, finance tools, you've got to look to the ballot. So in California, 2020 saw the most local measures in recent memory. In 2020, 2010, there were 108 ballot measures, local ballot measures. In 2020, 293. So almost triple the amount of ballot measures from local entities during the past 10 years. 81% of the ones this year were, were finance measures. There were finance measures, there were bond measures or sales tax measures. Next. So everything was just going great until we hit 2020 and the pandemic. So in 2020, the California appetite for tax measures has begun to decline. So you've got to look at your city. Most of the cities have done sales tax measures. If you haven't, take a look. Hopefully this is just a bubble. But if you haven't done one, you should explore the possibility of doing one. There's been so many um, voter approval of school board measures, school board bonds for the past nine years was 75%. In 2020, it fell to 36%. Voter approval of sales tax measures for the past five years, these are for cities mostly, that was 76% approval rating. That fell to 53% in 2020. Parcel tax measures, these are from school, dis school, school districts that need 66% um, during the past um, 19 years. Um, they, were, they were getting a 57% um, approval measure, and now it dropped to 35.2%. As you go forward, if you're going to do a sales tax measure, or if you're going to do a second one, or the one that you haven't done before, if you've not done it before, it's so tempted to put a sunset clause on your sales tax uh, measure. Um, those are easier to pass, but be careful. Don't do those unless you know every penny is going to go to capital infrastructure and it's not going to go to operations. If you put a sunset clause on your sales tax, um, you're not going to be able to use your money for operations, for cops, for fire, for libraries, for parks, for public works and things like that. I've experienced on that. Um, a few years ago, we adopted measure A in Long Beach with a sunset clause, a 10 year concept sunset clause, it passed overwhelmingly. Um, but then we recognized we better get rid of the sunset clause because there's so much pressure to use it for operations, PD, fire, all the other general fund components. Um, so um, we, the city of Long Beach put a measure on in March um, 2020. And we all know those measures can pass by 50 plus one. And here's an example of 50 plus one. 
Long Beach's measure passed with 50.01%. So those are really important. Next. Let's take a little um, look you see at local measures in the region. Let's compare LA and Orange County. They're fun to compare because they're two such different um, communities or counties. Um, in LA County um, in 2020, there were 22 sales tax measures, all from cities. Um, that's 25% of LA's 20, 88 cities, excuse me, 88 cities. 14 passed or eight failed. So 63% passed in LA County, which is pretty good. Um, it's better than the state average in 2020, which was 53. But before 2020, that average was 76. Orange County, on the other hand, they had 11 parcel tax measures. These were all school districts and two passed and nine failed. Not a single city in Orange County went for a sales tax um, measure. And finally, my last slide is to look at business improvement districts. Tim with MBS works on these all the time. If you're not familiar with the business improvement district, here's where the private sector, usually a corridor or a neighborhood, they initiate a tax upon themselves to improve the environment of their business district. That's usually a business license fee, extra or extra property taxes. And that's for economic development, clean teams, arts and entertainment, public safety, special events, whatever that district business district or corridor wants to see happen. So usually these are found on successful business districts. So if anyone's been in downtown LA, downtown Long Beach, West Hollywood, Santa Monica, Hollywood, Chinatown, um, any place that you've visited as a tourist on a successful corridor, trust me, there's a business um, district on that corridor. In the United States, there's over 1,000 uh, business districts. LA County has 50 with revenues over 200,000. Long Beach has eight. New York City has 76. And for those of you that are, are managing cities, um, you might have an entire district that might have you know, 1,000 residents and 200 businesses. You can just speak to one executive director of that business district instead of going, that, going through and talking, doing um, interviews and questionnaires for all that amount of people. So the district has a group of people like a city that speaks for itself and it's so much easier and more um, important to work with the district than just be scattered and work with various individual um, residents or individual businesses and stuff. And when they join together and have a plan, you can help them achieve that plan. So that's all I have. So thank you very, very much. Great, thank you so much, Pat. Um, next up, we're gonna go into a, a panel discussion and you're gonna hear a little bit more from each of our, um, each of our panelists here. I'm gonna go ahead and Stop my screen share so that we can see everybody. Perfect. Um, and just a quick reminder to the folks in the audience, um, if you have questions about anything you've heard already or anything that's going to come up in this discussion, um, please feel free to ask us questions and we'll get to them in just a bit uh, once we get through some of these, um, these questions we have for the panel to begin with. Um, so Tim and Bobby, you both talked about this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can elaborate on any of the trends that you're seeing in terms of recovery, are there are there types of local governments, cities, counties, or districts um, that are recovering faster than others, or any uh, geographic or demographic um, differences that you're seeing in terms of how fast people are coming coming back from the pandemic? I, I certainly see a bit of a have and a have not right over this uh, over the pandemic. I think and a lot of the data bears that out. What, what I was focusing on um, over this last week or what have you, and then hearing the discussion today, is it sort of like there's the big shift is between the developing communities, right, which we were talking about versus the built out communities. When you're in your more built out communities, there, there's a real hard lens looking at things like business improvement districts, right? There's a couple uh, in San Francisco that, are, that want to renew early because they want to pivot and they want to get ahead of these changes and do some different things. So that, you know, again, we talked about updating your fees, looking at voter approved taxes. Obviously those are political and you have to really think about how you engage your community and do that. So on the develop, that's that. And, and on the, the developing communities, it's having those conversations about what's desired and what needs to be done. And, you know, what's the system of your, you know, of your water, wastewater, that kind of thing. So do you need 
impact fees? Do you need capacity fees? Do you need a new fire station? You know, what, whatever it might be, um, that conversation. And it just, it just seems like I keep thinking of the bears coming out of hibernation. It seems like there's a lot of that going on right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, when we talk about the, especially on the sales tax side and, and the haves and the have nots and the diversity that we have here in California, um, we've definitely seen, you know, cities that are a little bit more in, in I tried to kind of highlight those in my, uh, in my slides, but those that are heavy on autos and heavy on building and construction like Lowe's and Home Depot, um, for the reasons that we've kind of talked about, housing hasn't decreased, housing's only increased. So those agencies have actually weathered this storm uh, fairly well. Those that are a little bit more dependent on uh, general retail and restaurants and tourism have been hit hard, especially hard here in the initial phases of, of the pandemic and the, and, you know, the recovery. The, um, it's likely that you know we're going to see those agencies that are more on the restaurants and tourism side they'll rebound faster later rather than what we've seen uh, certain jurisdictions you know be able to sustain and maintain through this the other um, thing to kind of keep keep in mind when we talk about the diversity of you know the state is um, you know some jurisdictions by way of land use and um, how they've uh, really structured their community um, have allowed for more warehouses and fulfillment centers. And when we think on sales tax, that fulfillment center side, sometimes for some city or for some businesses, they will allocate their sales tax dollars locally to where the, uh, where the fulfillment center is located. And so as consumers have shifted from brick and mortar to online sales, we've seen those communities that had, um, had those companies there may have had some you know, arrangements prior to the pandemic. We've seen them do much, much better and, uh, through, uh, through the pandemic, and that will likely continue as um, uh, consumer habits have changed. So, it, um, yeah, we're uh, extremely diverse, and, um, you know, those that, uh, those that have done really well, you know, as Tim had mentioned, and even Pat, um, you know, agencies maybe that had, that were struggling a little bit before the pandemic, who had already approved a local sales tax measure, now have that plus <laughs> kind of the better than expected results overall, they're actually, you know, in some cases, I know a few that I've talked to, they're like, wow, we have so much money we don't know what to do with almost. Um, it's a great problem to have. And when you layer in the ARPA funding that they're um, now trying to navigate and figure out how to spend, yeah, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, just a few years ago we thought, what are we going to do? And now, um, how uh, how do we manage this amount of money? So it's been very interesting given how diverse uh, California local agencies are. So thinking about that and some of the information that Pat um, presented around the appetite for sales tax measures and other things, do, are you thinking about um, longer term recovery? So does that is that going to have implications moving forward? Do you think um, in terms of the the willingness of the voters or um, you know, there's an influx of cash now, but if it's federal one-time funds, what does that mean for longer-term recovery or financial position for some of our local governments? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to a ballot measure and a, or a future, uh, you know, new tax revenue, whether it's, you know, fees or sales tax or property tax parcel, t you know, uh, uh, parcel tax measures, anything like that, communication is going to be the key telling and giving the community an understanding of even though there's the talk of better than expected results what does it really mean for your local um, agency um, city county or special district why is this new revenue needed and um, while voters may not uh, feel so great about a, a, a sales tax measure right now and new tax measures right now when you paint that picture and say, here's what it's gonna look like in five to 10 years, that long range, um, you're likely to have a little bit more success. It, um, depending on your local agency though, it, uh, it may, if, if you're saying right now, wow, we have all this money and we don't know what to do with, um, <laughs> it makes the longer range conversation a little bit tougher for, uh, for new tax revenues uh, down the way. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a tricky one to navigate, but communication and really telling the city or your local agency's story 
is, uh, is so vitally important. Definitely agree. Um, Pat, thinking back to your uh, to your presentation and your time as a city manager, um, what what advice would you have for the local leaders on the line in terms of trying to balance some of these priorities? And so you're seeing um, potentially again one time funds come in um, that you may not want to use for you know ongoing operations. Um, similar to the, the comments you were making about uh, where you were in Long Beach, where you um, didn't want you had sunset provisions, and so you didn't want to use those for ongoing costs. Um, what advice would you would you share with our local leaders about how to balance that, how to balance competing priorities and all of the things that um, they have to navigate? Uh, thank you. I've always um, talked to my elected officials um, in the terms of, of trust, and I would say whether you're a city manager or whether you're an executive director. Um, I had so many conversations when we present the budget that if I've been doing my job, I meet with elected officials every single week and I'm paying attention, I'm taking notes. What is it they want in their district or if there's not district, what do they want in the city? I think an executive director of a special district would be doing the same thing. So you've been paying attention. So I tell the electeds when I present my budget, I paid attention. The things that you have as priorities that you've been telling me and hitting me on the head for the past year, it's in the budget. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. And I may not have given you 100% of what you need, but I put something in there because I know how important that is to you. And then the trust is for the elected officials to recognize that you have to put things in the budget that take care of your organization. You have to have technology, you have to have the finance, you have to have uh, planning, you have to have the employees and the training. Without you know some of those things, you don't have a city. Let's, so without finance, you don't have a city. Um, and a lot of Electives, like they want to spend their money elsewhere. But if you don't, if you don't have a top-notch finance team and tech team, you're not going to have a city very, very soon. So it's just that kind of a trust thing. And again, if you're a, le a leader of a city or a special district, if you're paying attention to your elected or your boss, that should be reflected in the budget. And related to that, um, you you talked about about this as well. But for where you sit in terms of executive staff, so obviously you have to manage. Um, your your council priorities and um, the communication there, but also the breadth of staff at the, at the agency. And you talked a little bit about how challenging the past 18 months have been for for the staff level too, and the difference between the working from home and um, the frontline workers and that kind of thing. Any any thoughts on how to kind of maintain that morale and motivate staff um, to continue to work through um, these continuing changing uh, challenging times? We, we all have um, our own personalities. You have uh, people skill city managers, city managers that are more in, into the administrative functions and things like that. But the big deal is just listening to your employees and speaking to them and talking to them and visiting them. Whether you have an e-newsletter, whether it's a, a weekly blog or a weekly newsletter that goes to the employees and tells them how you're feeling and what's going on and things like that. And also you should have a fantastic relationship with your department heads because your department heads then meet with their managers and that trickles down to the line workers. And if you don't have a, a great relationship with the department head, that's gonna affect the entire department. So you've got to deal with that too. And then finally too, you have the have the conversation with your electeds. Everybody might watch your city council meeting or your special district meeting. And if the electeds are fighting, um, people are seeing that your employees are seeing that on TV. And it's it's kind of like it. I'm going to be as simple as it. it's mom and dad are fighting and what's happening to our family. And that impacts the entire organization of what you see on TV at, that happens at a council meeting. That's, that's definitely true. Uh, thank you for the, thank you for those thoughts. Um, going back to um, more of the, the voter approval and, and that kind of thing. Um, is there anything that you all have seen in your experience that is, is more successful um, in terms of types of taxes or fees that are, are more palatable for um, for folks or for voters as you're looking to pass those? Uh, Bobby, I'm sure this relates to your comments about um, the communication is key in telling that story. Um, but historically, have you found things that are easier to pass um, or tools that are, are more um, approved by your communities? I was just going to mention, you know, it was very interesting to look at those statistics again that Pat was sharing. You know, it used to be that school taxes generally passed because people are really invested in their schools and their communities and their kids and that kind of thing. Um, but obviously, when economic times get really tough, the, the deck chairs get moved around. But 
as, as uh, you know, we've talked about before, getting the public engaged, right? That public engagement and, and collaborative mood between the community can really pay off. We had um, a number of measures that we worked on past with flying colors during COVID, it literally with 70 percent plus uh, approval for parcel taxes for everything from library services to fire prevention. But it's because the communities were really involved, really invested, and wanted to see those things. You know, I'm sure uh, Pat can attest, you know, you throw a measure on the ballot at the last minute, you know, chances of it passing are <laughs> probably slim and slim to none. But if you lay that groundwork and you have those conversations, um, the, the chances of passage go, go way up. Yeah, sometimes um, the uh, the politically easy to pass and the financially impactful kind of run inverse, right? It's uh, it's the small ones that are easy uh, to touch on, and and I think you know Tim, you talked about this a lot, and Pat as well, is really go back to some of those easy fees that um, you know. Being a former finance director myself, I knew it was a place to go is reevaluate that and make sure that you're staying on top of that on an annual basis to uh, to ensure that it's not just when times are tough that you're coming back and increasing fees, uh, but really being consistent uh, and, and looking at that. The ones that make the most uh, financial impact like TOT increase, a sales tax increase or parcel tax, uh, school bond measures, those types of things, um, those can be you know more challenging and take a lot more work uh, they're usually the one-offs as well. So stay consistent with your with your normal fees to uh, to maintain pace, and then it um, really lays that groundwork with the communication when you need the big one-time um, burst to uh, to put your full efforts into it. I have just two things: utility taxes poll the worst, and then be careful of the loyal opposition with your city council or your boards. If you have electeds or appointed members that are going to openly campaign against it, you don't have, that's, that's really tough. Yeah, so uh, just to, to build on that, um, well, first I want to, I want to mention, um, as I mentioned at the outset, ILG has a whole program focused on public engagement. So as we're talking through this communicating with your community and engaging them, I just want to uh, reiterate and underscore <laughs> some of the comments that Bobby and Tim have made about um, building trust with your community. Um, so if you're going to them and asking for their input on, you know, what what needs they have, uh, make sure that you're following through with that or setting their expectations and managing those expectations, essentially. So if you've got a limited um, number of ideas on the table or options on the table, make sure you're you're telling them that and you're not opening it up for all of the ideas um, that, that they could have and, and promising them that you're going to fund and fulfill all of those ideas. But um, we could have an entire session just focused on um, public engagement and tips on that. But if you're interested in more, um, definitely encourage you to go to our website or reach out to me. I'm happy to um, to share more tips on on how to plan some of those engagement activities and um, really be proactive um, and think longer range about some of those ideas. Um, but curious um, for the panelists on the line, um, any any more explicit tips on how to communicate these complex ideas with your with your community? Is there anything that you've done in terms of types of types of engagement activities or presentations um, that you've done that have been really impactful um, to help the community understand some of these, um, for those of us with non-finance degrees. So <laughs> how do you help your community really understand and internalize what, what some of this means? Well, for better or worse, certainly the, the uh, adoption of Zoom all over has allowed a lot of communities to, to have more of these discussions that previously was only the dozen or so gadflies that showed up, you know, again and again and again at some of your meetings. So in that respect, um, there's been some very interesting developments and it'll be interesting to see sort of how the virtual world lives on after June 15th here. Yeah, that outreach, right, is, um, I remember um, just trying to hit a lot of local community groups, uh, do presentations at your senior center, uh, trying to, you got to get out of City Hall, and, and Tim, to your point now, is like, no, utilize technology as much as, uh, as, much as it's available 
to uh, to communicate the message and um, allow folks to uh, to jump in. I know um, many of us here um, have been uh, asked to do more presentations, right? And and sometimes it's more from the educational perspective. Think about doing a piece if your uh, your agency, um, if you've got a hot topic that um, the community will want to engage on their own time. Uh, do a recording. Uh, it's it is super easy. Um, do yourself a little video and um, kind of um, record that. Put it on the website and allow others to uh, to take it in on their own time. As far as that outreach goes, that uh, there's a lot of tools now. It used to we tried to do it more in, por in person, which was very limiting. Um, after hours and you know where and who and now um, really keep an open mind of what communication looks like for me i i've learned from it took a long time i've learned from my elected officials that um nobody knows more about community organizing and getting the word out and communication than your elected officials and their teams so while you as the manager or the or the director have to go out and do the, the heavy lifting and stuff engage your city council and get their ideas on how, how to get this through because your elected officials are experts at this stuff now that's a good point often your elected officials are out talking to the community and um, they're their constituents and so they may have um have heard things from their community that they that they can pass on and share as tips there um definitely agree that i think one of one of the positives that has come out of the the pandemic is this virtual engagement and um, we're hearing from a lot of our um, local government partners that they're seeing uh, increased engagement in this um, in this world because it's easy to jump on a zoom in your living room instead of um, after you get your kids fed into bed instead of trying to get to city hall to sit through a city council meeting at seven o'clock on a, a tuesday night that may or may not go until midnight um, and they have to sit through there to get their public comment heard so um, definitely uh, think that we're seeing increased engagement because of that and there have been so many to bobby's point virtual engagement options that have come online so it's not just zoom but there's platforms out there that are available um to you all to engage your community in online um in long, online ways whether that's surveys whether it's um just even going back to standard uh, newsletters and websites but there is also um companies that provide really in-depth um, public engagement services in a virtual environment um so something to consider even as we move back into in-person meetings as those become available to potentially consider um, continuing to do some of these online um, engagement activities as well. We've got a, one or two questions from the audience, not a ton yet, but if you guys have questions as you're continuing to hear the panelists talk, please um, please jump in. But I um, have one that I'd like to get a, a response to um, going back to special financing districts. Um, Tim, I think this is probably from your presentation, um, but can you use a special financing district or an assessment district um, to finance a new public cemetery. So could you talk a little bit more about what those types of um, financing districts can fund? Right, so uh, in terms of a special financing district, so that's obviously like a parcel tax or a CFD or an assessment district, they can uh, fund or finance a lot of different improvements. Uh, I, th I think if the question is particularly around a cemetery district, so from a special district, perspective I'm assuming that would be that would have to be more along the lines of a you know parcel tax or CFD you could not uh, do an assessment district you have, you have to show that's more of a general benefit so uh, assessment districts have to be specific benefit property right versus uh, like you can't do an assessment district for police services let's say right that's just completely off the off the books but um there there certainly are some options there um and uh if a county service area also has some um opportunities to do things depending on how that is structured you know from a um, organizational standpoint perfect thank you um for folks that are looking for for more resources on this topic obviously we we there's a lot of um energy around the arpa right now and a lot of training happening on that but any other um suggestions for trainings or resources or organizations um we've mentioned csmfo earlier but any any thoughts on where folks could go to get more training or information on some of these topics
<laughs> I'll jump in. Um, no, I think one of them, and uh, and regretfully, I think uh, to a degree, my time at a local agency, I probably didn't lean on my consultants enough. And so now being on this side of the table, um, you know, many times the educational items and especially when it comes to economics, the news travels so fast. It's like drinking out of a water hose uh, or a fire hose and you just can't take it all in. Um, really think about leaning on your consultants for education and, and information that uh, may be valuable to whether it be a board or a, or a city council or the community um, to do presentations. Well, like we said, you know, Zoom and, and the video option makes a lot of us more, accept, more accessible during different times of the day to uh, to really think about if you need uh, what's going on now, what's a hot topic um, because it's ultra ultimately sensitive, time sensitive, is really lean on your consultants to uh, to see what they can provide uh, during this time. It uh, you might be surprised or you might just be uh, uh, pleased with uh, being able to get uh, information uh, back to your community very quickly. Um, I'll put in a quick plug for um, our affiliates. So as I mentioned at the outset, the League, um, as well as CSAC and CSDA, all have great resources and training programs um, for you all. And so that uh, I know, for example, with the League of Cities has a whole municipal finance um, conference that they do towards the end of the year. So that's another place that you all can be looking for um, additional training for your, for your elected officials or for um, your staff that may not work exclusively in the finance department. Um, to get them a little bit more information. Um, we do have another question that's related to Zoom, um, and I'm not sure if you guys have any explicit guidance here, but just want to throw it out there in case you have um, had an experience here and a good way to do this. Um, so, Bobby, uh, we've all kind of talked a little bit about how the virtual engagement and, and these Zoom platforms have um, have increased access, um, but we in an instance where you're recording a meeting because you want residents to be able to come back and review it after the fact, um, have you guys come across any great way of um, allowing them to ask questions? So what, is it just perhaps, you know, providing a staff contact, um, or is there anything else that you guys have found to be really good um, for people to follow up a recorded meeting? I think, yeah, just listing a, a solid point of contact that's uh, that somebody that's responsible and that's going to have the time to, to respond is, um, is most notable if you're doing a recording and it could be you know the individual themselves you know to to pat's point there isn't anybody who knows more likely more about the topic or you know the the issue uh, related to your agency than the person given the the presentation or doing the recording uh, really identify that expert and uh, and just make sure everybody knows that that's the the expert that uh, that you have Sometimes that can be a little intimidating to to can think about ourselves as experts, but really um, at your local agency, the likelihood you're an expert in probably two or three different things. Um, some of you, at uh, especially upper management, probably wear multiple hats, and you could consider yourself uh, truly an expert in multiple uh, different topics. And so, really, um, for the benefit of your community, put yourself in those shoes and. Um, then uh, then be available which most of us with a servants mentality we uh, we open ourselves up pretty willingly to our community uh, so just take the time with the follow-up uh, follow-up questions and I think the most successful ones that I see are um, you know designate a web page on your site uh, for whatever your topic is list some of the frequently asked questions and give the responses so that Again, those that may, may be taking it in after hours, they can stream through and, oh, I had that question, here's the answer, right? Is, is go ahead and publicize a lot more of that uh, to, uh, it may end up inevitably limiting the number of questions you get down the road. Perfect. Um, well, looking at the time, um, would love if you guys can just, uh, with as one closeout question, um, anything that local government should be thinking about to prepare for the completely post-COVID era. So we're in this kind of recovery phase, things are starting to reopen, things are starting to come back online, but any uh, advice or anything that they should be thinking about longer term? Uh, 
I think, I mean, just the, the many of the principles we talked about set in the stage is going to really, I think, put that foundation in place for going forward uh, into the next, you know, even though we're talking so much now about the next six, 12, 18 months, I think that's going to be foundational for the next three, five, 10 years. Um, certainly, it's hard to predict much further than, you know, just a year or two out, but that'd be my thought. You don't have your crystal ball going today, Tim, to let us know what, <laughs> what it looks like in five or 10 years. So we're, we're, our team's getting ready to, uh, to analyze all the data that we just got and uh, talk about our long range forecast. Um, I can share with you that many of us believe um, we initially thought the pandemic was going to cut in and really cause a deep recession to where we would have then had a, a long, slow recovery coming out of this. It's likely because of the federal stimulus that we see it to be relatively short term, um, even if it's called an economic slowdown, which would be, you know, probably mind bending to think we went through a pandemic and it was only economically slowing us down. Um, but that might be the case. And over the next three to five years, um, gear up for maybe some traditional, you know, slash historical growth uh, expected, you know, two to three percent fairly steadily, maybe get ourselves back into a normal economic cycle. So five years to seven years down the road, see another, you know, quote unquote, recessionary period. Um, I can tell you those that were doing long range forecasts in the middle of the pandemic probably have to rip all those up now. Um, seeing the steadiness of this recovery, I think um, this next year or so, spending time on your long term or long range forecasting, this is a better a better opportunity to do that. And, uh, and really consider both sides of the ledger. We talked a lot about the revenue side today and fees and growing revenues, but you're gonna have those expenditures and be realistic with the fact that unions are gonna be knocking on your door, um, asking for their contracts to be uh, renegotiated. And um, now's the time I think with, uh, with this feeling of reopening and stability that uh, it's probably the better time to, to spend on your long range type, uh, type thoughts and plans. My comments would only be just be open for business because you haven't, we haven't been open for business. Be, be innovative, be exciting, talk to your staff, make sure everybody, their morale is high and excitement's there to, to be open and engaging with the public and get those permits issued. Um, you know, don't be afraid to do something innovative. Buy an ice rink, um, <laughs> keep those parklets alive, or, you know, don't worry about maybe, you know, well, worry about it, work with your elected city. Are you gonna keep that street closed um, for pedestrian access? Build more bike lanes, um, just stuff to make it a livable city. So just be open for business, and don't shut the private sector out when they're knocking on your door right now because you're probably going to get a lot of ideas after we exit the pandemic and you should at least embrace those ideas. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of just closeout slides to share with you all with contact information and things like that. So let me turn the screen share back on. Uh, just want to do a quick plug for a couple of upcoming webinars from ILG's perspective. Uh, we're hosting one tomorrow on wildfire risk and resilience um, and a new tool from the National League of Cities that is available to our local governments to help um, plan for and navigate some of those um, very challenging situations. Uh, and then we're also hosting a series of webinars on the housing crisis and how um, helping local governments navigate that. Um, the next one up in that series is going to be on uh, fair housing requirements and the overlay of equity um, and housing. And so all of that's on our website. But if you're interested in some topics outside of the strictly finance space, definitely check those out. Um, here's how you can stay in touch with ILG if you want information about our resources or training. Um, and then I'm going to get this slide up. So this is our contact information. If you have any questions um, that you weren't able to ask this afternoon or anything comes up as you're thinking um, about these topics moving forward, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and with that, I just want to thank our panelists for joining me this afternoon and um, sharing all of their wisdom. Um, Tim, Bobby, or Pat, any closing thoughts before we um, we jump off the webinar this afternoon? I go back to my initial three, don't assume, step back and think strategically. <laughs> all good Not advice. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, not much for me. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak. It's uh, it, it's actually really nice to to think and talk optimistically now, especially about the economy. So it's uh, as as we kind of get back into no societal norms, it uh, it feels good and positive uh, to uh, to speak in this context versus a year ago. So I'm, I'm so glad you uh, allowed allowed me to join. Okay, well with that, I definitely just want to thank everybody on the line for joining us this afternoon um, and thank our panelists one more time and I hope everybody has a great evening. Good afternoon all.